So thank you very much for asking me to speak. It's an honor to do this, and I apologize to you, but I could just not travel uh, to be there uh, with you today. But I think it's a wonderful meeting, and I thank thanks again for the opportunity to be part of it. These are my disclosures, and uh, uh, again, I thank all the people who have supported uh, uh, our work uh, up to this point. Now, Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease, just to review it quickly, was first described in 1860 by Jean-Martin Charcot and his student, Pierre-Marie, and at the same time in England by Howard Henry Tooth. And uh, uh, again, I'm not sure how well Charcot and Marie actually even knew uh, Tooth, but their names are forever linked with these uh, disorders. And as many people in the audience know that over the years, we've learned that you can separate different types of CMT based on where the problem starts. If the problem starts in the myelin insulation around the peripheral nerves, we typically call this CMT type one. And if the problem starts with the nerve fiber itself, which we call the axon, we call that CMT uh, type two. And this has been known for many years, even before uh, of the genetic revolution. And clinical hallmarks are similar in both, although they can appear at different, at different times in different types of CMT. But usually weakness is worse in the lower parts of the legs and the lower parts of the arms. And in addition to weakness, there's a lot of problems with balance. And that comes from difficulties with what we call proprioception, which is the sending the message from your feet to your brain where you are in space. And when that's impaired, it makes it hard to get around. Uh, it's a lot of work, as we just heard with those lovely presentations, to have CMT. And that can take a lot out of somebody. And fatigue is a common part, uh, as we'll see in a couple slides coming up. Through the work of Stefan, who you're going to hear from soon, and many others, uh, We've gone from not knowing any genetic causes of CMT uh, in 1990 to now uh, there's probably over 100 different genes that can cause CMT type 1 or type 2. And there are recessive forms of CMT, which means you need to have two copies of a gene to get the disease, and we call those CMT uh, type 4. In the United States, there are panels for genetic testing, and they have about 30 to 50 of these uh, 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 genes on them. Uh, so I think it's important to recognize that if your physician thinks that you have CMT and the tests come back negative, it doesn't mean necessarily that you don't have CMT. It just means that it wasn't detected by those tests. Now, how is CMT diagnosed? And there's a list of important ways uh, that we look to make a diagnosis of CMT, but Again, it's important to realize that not all of these work all the time. So for example, we've heard that CMT is a genetic disease, but that doesn't always mean that parents or uh, previous generations have people who are affected with CMT. CMT1A is the most common form of CMT, and even in that instance, 10% of all the cases are de novo. They just start with that person. So there's not always a family history, and physicians have to be careful about that. The neurological examination is important to make sure that the exam fits with what we know about CMT and to see, for example, if reflexes are decreased rather than increased. And everybody's least favorite test is also very important, and that's the nerve conduction test, because if we know that the nerve conduction velocities are slow, we know that it, the myelin is the problem, and that would be CMT type 1. Alternatively, if the nerve conduction velocities are normal speed, but the size of the waves are small, that tells us it's CMT type 2. And then, uh, if we have that narrowed down, that's a, at least in our clinic, that's the point where we move towards genetic testing. And this is an important issue also, if the patients want genetic testing. There are reasons for and against uh, uh, genetic testing, and in, at least in my opinion, in a quality program, 
patients and their families need to be brought into these uh, discussions because there are advantages and disadvantages. And I don't have time to go into that now, but I just want to mention that point. Now, these next couple of slides just show some pictures that uh, many of you will be familiar with, and that's that uh, there are foot deformities that occur in many, though not all, patients with CMT. And these typically occur because there's developmental mismatches in uh, 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 foot muscle weakness growing up, and it tends to bring the feet in and uh, uh, make high arches. And in many instances, this needs to end up in surgery, but not all issue instances. So for example, if the feet can uh, passively, passively be brought into a neutral position, uh, in many instances, bracing suffices and surgery is not needed. And I think you can see on the right picture, uh, the hammer toes. And again, managing those conservatively is often uh, the best situation. Now, these are just some other things that can happen, uh, and uh, the broken bones are things that we try to uh, avoid by having people use braces or AFOs or other ambulation aids just to make sure they don't fall and break bones, and again, keeping track of uh, uh, cuts in a person's foot to make sure uh, that they don't get infected is an important issue, particularly because the ability to feel touch is often impaired. Now, if uh, we move to the upper extremity, uh, you'll see some issues that many people have uh, with their hands with fine movements uh, with CMT. Gripping, at least in our experience, is relatively impaired, but fine movements that require pinching activities, uh, such as you see here, trying to unseal a bag or uh, fastening a necklace or buttoning a shirt, that type of activity is often uh, uh, a part of CMT. And there are good uh, occupational therapy or OT approaches to help with this. And that's an important part of current management of CMT. One issue that's important that comes up a lot and there's a lot of misinformation, at least in my opinion, uh, on is pain, because many patients are told that you're not supposed to have pain with CMT, and at least in our experience, that's not correct. We tend to differentiate pain into two big groups. One is what we call nerve pain, which is burning and tingling, uh, feeling like your feet are on hot coals. That occurs in about just about 10 to 20 percent of CMT patients. However, Having weak ankles and problems uh, with your joints puts a lot of stress on the joints so that ankles and knees and hips have to do more work than they ordinarily would have to do uh, in somebody who does not have CMT. And this causes a lot of arthritic type pain. And our experience is probably over half of our patients with CMT who at least are over the age of 40 or 50 uh, have some sort of issues with arthritic pain and that needs to be managed appropriately. One of the important uh, uh, issues that's come out and uh, with a lot of support from the FDA on this is just the, uh, uh, the necessity to get patient input into what's important to them as we try to move towards treatments. And the HNF was very good in putting together this uh, prospective uh, uh, study uh, with Acceleron uh, uh, Pharma, and you can just see some of the issues on this slide. So if you look under the very much column on the left, uh, you can see that uh, uh, problems with balance and fatigue, uh, these are really prominent uh, concerns with uh, living with CMT, and I think they're related because it takes a lot of work to make sure that you don't fall and you're in good situations. And I think these kind of issues are important, and we're going to touch on this again uh, in a little bit, but having input from patients about the things that bother them a lot uh, or uh, just a little bit or even not at all, just 
So it's not the doctors who are telling patients what are important, it's the patients who are telling the doctors what, what's important. Now, what we've talked about briefly are some of the common features of CMT, but there are issues that come up, and these don't come up in all the subtypes of CMT, they come up in some of them. So for example, some types of CMT are known to have problems with hearing depending upon the mutation. And I would just give a couple of examples, and that would be uh, some of the mutations with CMTX and some of the mutations with CMT1B. Those are known to have hearing problems. Similarly, vision problems with optic atrophy can occur in some but not all types of CMT. And when this occurs, it's typically because the mutated gene has a role to play in uh, uh, the visual system as well as the peripheral nerves. And two examples of this are CMT type 2A, and also uh, which is caused by mutations in a gene called MFN2, and then also a CMT type 4A, which ca is caused by mutations in a gene called GDAP1. So again, optic atrophy, and also vocal cord paralysis, which is right under that, they can occur, but not in all subtypes. So it's important to talk with your doctor to see if uh, the subtype that you have is one that's known to be associated with these. And I think breathing is similar. Uh, and again, this is a clinical uh, uh, evaluation that's important to make. And it can't really be made just by an EMG or nerve conductions because all the nerves, for example, in CMT1A that go to muscles are going to have low nerve conduction velocities, including the ones going to the diaphragm. So some uh, specific x-ray studies and breathing studies often need to be done to see if there's a real issue there. Um, growing up, many of the CMT subtypes can cause scoliosis. Uh, hip dysplasia, and we talked about balance, which is proprioception, and hand tremors. And in fact, two students of Charcot uh, and Marie first noted uh, the hand tremors, and those were doctors Rusi and Levy. And so uh, people uh, with experience in CMT would sometimes describe those patients as having the Rusi levy syndrome. Now, we are extremely happy to have the HNF uh, join us now to be uh, part of uh, our Inherited Neuropathy Consortium, and we've been very pleased to have the CMTA and the MDA be supporting uh, uh, the Inherited Neuropathy Consortium along with NIH and NCATS for the last nine years. And what we have done is take centers like the one we have here in Iowa and link them up with centers all around the world, as far away as Australia, evaluate patients in the same way to try to get natural history data so that we can have quality clinical uh, uh, trials for CMT. And we're proud that we now have over 10,000 participants in our protocols, and we evaluate over 5,000 patients in our natural history. And these natural history studies uh, have allowed us to begin getting understandings of how we can tell if uh, treatments will be effective in patients with CMT. And again, the FDA has been very helpful uh, with this as well. What we do in the INC is we develop outcome instruments, and I'll show you a couple of those in uh, the next slide or two. And uh, uh, we have the genetic uh, research from people like Stefan so that we can actually look at the different natural history studies for the different subtypes of CMT. And more recently, partnerships with our colleagues in London, uh, as at the University of College London at the National Hospital of Neurology, uh, we in uh, Iowa have been working on look, uh, identifying called the fat fraction of muscle uh, within the MRI of the leg and showing that that can detect progression very rapidly in people with CMT even before there's any clinical change. And we also are looking at skin biopsies because there are little nerves in skin that have myelin on them, and we can look at gene expression uh, and uh, in these skin biopsies. And for example, in CMT1A, we can even measure the levels of PM22 in those nerves. So we have a target marker for uh, clinical trials. And then we are biobanking fibroblasts to develop into what are called 
immortalized pluripotential stem cells, or iPSCs, and these are with a colleague of Dr. Zuckner's, uh, Mario Saporta. So these are some of the uh, uh, approaches that we're taking within the INC. And these are just a couple of the scales that we use. And the reason I'm showing you these is to show you that we're now able to, uh, in a quantitative way, evaluate uh, the impairment due to CMT throughout a person's entire life. So we have colleagues in Australia, and Mel Mandarakis and her colleagues, uh, and uh, Orni Sanmanichi from Thailand, and the group here in Iowa, and uh, uh, have uh, and in London have put together a info which is just going to be published in a journal called Brain in the next month, and this enables us to begin even from birth trying to detect uh, changes in uh, infants with CMT. We've developed a CMT pediatric scale, which was first uh, published in 2012, and we can show with this scale that we can detect progression in different subtypes of CMT from the ages of three up until 20. And then uh, this is a functional scale, so it's not just things doctors mention, I mean, can measure. It's a way to see what patients can actually do. And we've now extended this into adults, and this has just been published also. This is with the help of David Herman and his colleagues at Rochester. This is called the CMT Functional Outcome Scale. And finally, for more than 18 years, we've had the CMT neuropathy score, and we follow, uh, for example, uh, over 1,000 patients with CMT1A with this scale, and we have natural history data on them. And then in the picture above, getting back to the biomarkers a little bit, and you can see that that little red area uh, on the upper right there, that's the fat fraction in muscles, and we can look at that and see how that changes in a very short time. Um, and going back to the earlier slide I showed you from the HNF, uh, we recognize that patient-reported disability outcome measures for disease burden are essential to uh, have a, a look at as outcome measures in trials and in natural history studies. And with the help of our colleagues in Rochester, we've uh, just published what's called the CMT Health Index, which is going to be used routinely uh, going forward in our Inherited Neuropathy Consortium sites. And this is a questionnaire which has been developed scientifically uh, based on input from patients with CMT. And again, we'll be, we'll be using the CMT HI to get patients' perspective on any potential uh, treatment trials. So the last slide is just uh, 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 a slide to emphasize that this is not people uh, just like me alone or even Stefan alone, but what makes this possible is what we believe is what patients and their families want, and that's that to have the investigators who are interested in CMT work together, not in isolation, to try to develop these approaches uh, to treatment. Because uh, for rare diseases, it's just impossible to have one place working on it in one country and another place in a different country or in a different part of a country and not, and not collaborate, because no progress will ever get done. So we need to work together, but we also need to have uh, support. And the INC has been uh, supported, and there's a typo here, I apologize for that, but by the uh, NINDS and NCATS, uh, and it's also been supported by the CMTA and the Muscular Dystrophy Association for many years. And as I said earlier, we're very excited to have Allison and the HNF become uh, a part of the uh, IMC. And I pledge to you from all of us that we're going to keep working as best as we can to bring real treatments uh, to people with the CMT. And thanks again for asking me to talk.